This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. In thinking about the, uh, the advanced care planning session we did last week and why we want to do advanced care planning, um, to think about a future in which we may not be able to speak for ourselves, um, I wanted to share a poem, another, another poem. This poem is called Otherwise by Jane Kenyon. Otherwise. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal. Sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning, I did the work I love. At noon, I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this day. But one day, I know it will be otherwise. And I know that uh, for many of us in the room, perhaps it already is otherwise, or for many of us, we have loved ones for whom it is. Uh, and we all know that, as the poem states, for each of us, it will be that way one day. And, um, it's for all of those and all of us um, that palliative care is so important uh, and why advanced care planning is such an important issue um, for so many of us. Today we're um, fortunate to have with us uh, Reverend Dina Joseph. Uh, Dina is the chaplain for our palliative care service and is also the associate director of the palliative care service here uh, at UCSF. And Dina has really played a tremendous leadership role um, in uh, promoting uh, spiritual care and serious illness, and also uh, in promoting uh, not only spiritual care, but self-care for those of us who provide palliative care and for other staff across the entire uh, medical center and, and hospital and, uh, here at UCSF. Um, Dean has been a real leader here in our program and has um, done really remarkable work um, in integrating spiritual care into not only palliative care, but into the care we provide generally, and really trying to understand and teach about the spiritual dimension of illness, which is what she'll talk to us about today. Uh, her talk is titled, Are There Atheists in a Foxhole? Uh, spiritual Issues in Serious and Terminal Illness. Please join me in welcoming Dina Joseph. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and I appreciate each and every one of you for coming out and participating in this class. I think it's awesome that you have the interest and the willingness to make the effort to be here. Thank you. Um, Dr. Panelat reading the poem reminded me of my mentor, Dr. Steve McPhee, one of the founding physicians along with Dr. Panelat of our palliative care service. We have a mature service. I think we're on our 16th year. I've been with it for almost 10 years. And uh, what made me think of Dr. McPhee is that in the days before the cell phone revolution, he really spearheaded um, keeping a track of poems and using poetry as part of his care of the ill. And he had what he called his poem pilot. And when he retired, he gave it to me. And it's, it's his collection of poetry that he uh, put together over 
a decade or more of taking care of seriously ill patients. So I just want to honor him and you as well, Dr. Panelat, for your work. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you about something I feel very deeply about. So a few things before we start. Um, I am a chaplain. I also have a background in psychotherapy. Uh, chaplaincy and spiritual care is my second career. I started in my 50s. And I did it primarily because as a lifetime meditator and contemplative, I was looking for a way to really bring my spiritual practice more into my daily life and my work life in particular. Chaplaincy seemed like a, a good way to start that integration, and I've been thrilled and delighted to discover that um, it's turned out to be a place where I can use all of myself, my counseling skills, as well as um, my contemplative background to contribute to the alleviation of suffering, which is what I see as the primary goal of our care. So I wanted to just say a word about the title. Are there atheists in foxholes? Some people may be familiar with that term, that phrase that comes from World War I when combatants actually dug holes, put themselves inside them, and shot across lines at each other. But really the question is, how do we cope with the threat that illness, serious and terminal illness, um, creates for each of us? in our, not just bodies, but in our minds, in our hearts, in our psyches, in our souls. And uh, that's the question, really, that I hope to address today. And the other caveat, I just want to address the word spiritual. This is a very vague and difficult term to define. I'm going to give you a little bit of a working definition, but just simply to say, in this context of this talk, for anybody who has any concerns with that word, it's really OK to just think emotional, spiritual, relational, existential. This is the domain um, that I'm going to be talking about tonight under the rubric of spiritual issues or spiritual care. So really, these are the universal issues of heart and mind and spirit that affect people when illness. So. You know, in academics, you always have to have objectives for your talk. So the first objective is to attempt to contextualize spiritual care in the context of the goals of palliative care. Dr. Panelat presented one version of goals of palliative care in a prior talk. I'm kind of shifting the focus slightly um, to really focus on quality of life and the issue of suffering in the context of serious and terminal illness. I will be saying a lot more about suffering, and we'll have a chance to think about that together. I'm going to talk a little bit about the domains of religion, spirituality, and culture, because that, taken together, is kind of the field in which our care takes place. It's not simply uh, a matter of medicine, but also what people believe, what their values are, what their worldview is, and what impact all of that has on care, treatment decisions, and um, experience of illness and end of life. Then we're going to take a deeper dive into the specific spiritual needs that I use in my assessment, which are belonging or love, meaning, and reconciliation. So we'll just give you a lot of examples to just give you a flavor of what spiritual care in palliative care looks like. And finally, to reflect on what the experience of illness, suffering, and dying of others might have to teach us and contribute to our, our learning and our understanding. Um, this is my personal hope for you out of tonight's talk, is that you develop 
a deeper understanding and compassion for the challenges of living with serious and terminal illness. There may be many of you in this room who are living that right now or have cared for someone who's going through that or been through that. And my second uh, objective or wish for you is to have a deeper understanding and compassion for the suffering of illness. So what is suffering? We, I think, use that term. It's another one of those difficult things to define. I'm using a definition here that I find extremely useful in working with patients and families. It comes from a physician, Eric Cassell, one of the few in my uh, reading, who's actually tackled the question of suffering and has a book called Suffering and the Goals of Medicine. And he defines suffering as the experience that occurs in the face of an impending <coughs> disintegration of one or more aspects of a person's selfhood or personhood. From that perspective, really, all illness has an element of suffering as part of it. And I like to think about what this would be, because some of the elements of suffering aren't always apparent to us. So I think of a patient who had a cancer of the arm and the chest that kept her from being able to hold her baby. And that was a source of, as you can imagine, great suffering for her. It wasn't just the cancer, but it was the loss of that role and that function of being able to live out that role with, with her child. That would be an example. Um, a patient who was a uh, end of year final training as a physician diagnosed with a terminal cancer whose suffering was that she was never going to get to live as a physician and practice as a physician. And her suffering in that loss was huge. That was a loss of a role as, as well as a loss of a dream. Another loss that I find associated with suffering in our patients is the loss of a sense of a secure future. You don't realize that you build this belief of a future. We all have, have to do this to carry on. But illness, any of you who have been diagnosed, you realize that your, your plan and your vision of your future is instantaneously impacted by that diagnosis. I was meeting with a friend who is here in the hospital um, today, and he described the experience, he said his, if his life was on wheels, like an automobile, the wheels had come off the bus. And he just felt like there was no momentum and no sense of uh, life going forward for him. So the loss of the future is another one of these losses. So suffering and the loss of parts of the self can include functions, activities, the obvious things like mobility. Um, one that came up for a family member of mine was the ability to use the bathroom in private. Things that here in, as clinicians we see commodes in many, many rooms, but we don't necessarily think about what that it connotes for our patients. Um, social relations, relationships, every relationship is impacted by the presence of illness. Couples where one person suddenly becomes the caregiver and one person becomes dependent um, is, a, is an example of that. Parent-child relationships where children become caretakers for parents. So these upheavals in relationship. Um, and in general, just your, what we call your assumptive world, the basic assumptions you make about life. They may be illusory, but we all make them. And the experience of illness and a serious diagnosis often just brings us up short. And we're faced with um, the, sometimes the shattering of our assumptive world. 
and this is what causes suffering. I'm not to say that people can't recover from this, and a lot of our focus and um, obligation in palliative care is to attempt to address suffering. Most obviously, the medical aspects of a person's um, symptom picture so that um, they're not suffering unnecessarily in terms of their medical care. But beyond that, patients and families experience illness on every level of their being. And palliative care as a approach to the care of the seriously ill tries to address the suffering on every level of a person's being as well. I want to also acknowledge palliative care is not something you can provide as a solo person. It's really, as Dr. Panelat says, a team sport. Um, and I want to just acknowledge that along with spiritual care, we also, on our team, have nursing and social work. And we, three disciplines, all overlap in our addressing some of these other dimensions of care. So I had fun making a couple graphics. This is that uh, rubric of religion, spirituality, and culture. So spiritual care tries to address suffering in all of these domains. What I think is important is for, because a lot of people are not that familiar with spiritual care, that we understand that it's far more than simply religious oriented care. The aspect of religion is very significant for a proportion of our patients and families, but by no means all of them. For those for whom it is important, addressing religious needs and supporting people's expression of their religious practice and faith can be uh, a force for great healing for people. It's not only that, however, and we will address the issue of religious wounding later in the talk. The, the second domain is spirituality, and uh, that, I'm trying to say, is a bigger realm than religion for many people. And I'm not going to try to tackle a definition of spirituality. Groups of people have tried very hard to um, come up with definitions. But just for our working definition for tonight, it's the realm of essentially the, the important questions that define us as human beings. What is the value of my life? What is important? What gives meaning to my life? These kinds of questions we are framing as spiritually uh, oriented needs of patients and families. And then finally, to speak about culture uh, briefly, even sometimes I'll go to a room and a patient will say, well, I'm not religious. And I'm thinking, well, you're still going to have spiritual needs. But they might say, and I have no need for a chaplain, you know, you know whatever. But um, we're all embedded in a cultural context. And culture has a great deal to say about the experience of illness and dying, and medicine, and treatment decisions, and so forth. So we will be talking about spirituality and culture a bit more than religion, but just so you have a map of where we're going tonight. So here's my other graph. Everything else is print. But core spiritual and existential needs, there are many assessment models out there for trying to think about people's spiritual slash existential needs. This is the one that I use. Um, it's very straightforward and pretty easy, I think, for us to grasp. A primary spiritual need being connection, and I will um, address each of these in depth as we go, meaning and reconciliation. The research on spiritual needs of patients with serious and terminal illness is that 25 to 50% of patients 
feel that their spiritual needs are inadequately or simply not addressed at all in the context of their medical care. And, and they wish that they, they would be. So um, in palliative care, we really take these needs very seriously. There's also a correlation between patients whose spiritual needs, and this is, again, the whole rubric here, um, are met, have a higher quality of life versus those who feel that those needs are not being met correlates with a uh, less favorable quality of life. So we're going to dive into each of the three core spiritual needs, the first being connection and belonging. So if you were to put yourself imaginatively on a bed upstairs, having been told that you had a terminal illness and a few months to live, then in palliative care, we get to ask, what's most important to you in that context? It really sharpens the vision for people to think about what's most important. I'd like to hear, if you wouldn't mind, a few people. What do you think you'd say to that question? So you'd be worried about being a burden to your family. OK, great. Yes? Family and friends, right. We'll come back to it. Anybody else think what they would be thinking about if they were asked, how do you want to spend your time? What's most important to you in this context? For me, it would be my connection with spirit. Your connection with spirit. Great. Any other thoughts? Beautiful. What, what makes you happy? Lovely. OK. So. Hands down, the number one thing people say is family and friends. I think that's a, a really important takeaway just there. I'd say maybe 2% of the several thousand patients I've taken care of have said, oh, there's this work thing I really, really want to get done. <laughs> Um, the, one, the one person I do recall saying that was in the middle of a huge art installation that she had devoted years of her effort to and was really her legacy work. And it's caused her great pain to not be able to finish that. But by and large, as we said, wanting to give and receive love is the primary need of people when they're ill whether it's an illness they can recover from or one that will lead to their demise. When we think about connection, I think it's also relevant to expand a little bit beyond just those that we love. That this sense of connection, and some people alluded to it, connection to spirit, when we're talking about connection, or I'm talking about it, I'm not just talking about those beloveds who are in your close inner circle. Connection to self can be ruptured in the experience of illness. There are many ways in which the experience of illness can cause an alienation or a fracture or fragmenting of the sense of self. If you go back to that definition that Eric Cassell has of suffering as a disintegration, so even something like um, receiving a treatment that changes your body image, even if it's something that nobody else can see, can have a huge impact on your relationship to your sense of self. So one of our ways we think about spiritual care in this context is how can we support the healing of these ruptures that happen for people. Another example of connection is connection to nature. And the hospitals are such sterile environments of necessity. But for many people, particularly people who are hospitalized for length, lengthy stays, the being cut off from the world of nature can represent a huge dis disruption in the integrity of the self. Um, the example I have is a friend of mine who, 
allowed, gave me permission to share this story, who suffered an electrocution event as a young man and was in an ICU for many months on the East Coast. And he describes a turning point in his healing was when a friend of his brought in a snowball and he could have the experience of that beauty and that intensity from the outdoors. Many people who have strong relationships with nature really struggle with the disruption in that relationship that comes from illness. And it's sometimes I'll bring in things like herbs from my garden to just give people something they can smell. Um, of course, flowers for some people. I think it's part of why we do that. The disruption can be in your spiritual dimension or in your relationship to God. <coughs> Those are the people who have that belief system. Um, the community, the sense of sacred. So this sense of connection is just a huge area of spiritual need for patients and families. Cultivating self-compassion as an aspect, um, somebody mentioned this fear of being a burden. This is an extremely <coughs> common, I've heard it, I saw five patients today, I heard it from two of them. It's an extremely common expression of a concern that patients have. And again, it's that worth, worry about, um, is my connection to others dysregulated in some way that's causing harm? And self-compassion is what I usually say to people who are worrying about being a burden is, of course, we're not going to deny that it is taking effort to care for you. Um, however, if the table were turned, in this case today it was a, a woman who was ill and her husband saying, I'm here till, till the finish line is how he expressed it. And her, she's saying, I don't want to burden you. And he said, well, if the tables were turned, I have every faith and confidence that you'd be here for me. And generally that is true. So we try to cultivate a compassion for oneself. Uh, nobody chooses or wishes to be ill or to be in a position of dependency. And then I'd like to speak for a moment about fear. I think fear is one of the great common denominators in our patient population, um, but often difficult to surface. So I will pretty directly ask people what their fears are, or are they afraid, um, to try to surface and get that conversation fo brought forward. I learned from a family member who uh, died some years ago, one of my beloved sisters, who had a tremendous fear of death. Um, and we worked out this thing where she would just reach out her hands and say, primal fear. And when she said that, we all knew to come close, hold her, hold her hands, touch her, reassure her, just as you would a child. Because illness can be a regressive experience for people. And uh, there's a whole field of psychology called terror management theory. And that is a whole area of psychology that deals with the fear of death. And the theory is essentially this, that we all as organismic organisms have a instinct for self-preservation. And as human beings, we have consciousness of our mortality. And when consciousness of mortality, and I'm not talking about the kind that we have as a generic consciousness, but the kind that we have when we've been given a diagnosis. Things change in that moment in terms of one's awareness of mortality. And when that acuity of awareness is, meets that instinct for self-preservation, for many people, it leads to an experience of terror. So identifying and addressing fears, and essentially how I do that is by trying to normalize them and teaching, teaching them what I learned from my sister about reaching out and making contact. I think for many people, having the experience normalized, having it 
spoken about and having an intervention, something to do to address fear, goes a very long way. The second area of spiritual need has to do with meaning. And I know I said spirituality in general has to do with meaning, but you can see there's belonging needs, there's meaning needs, and there's reconciliation needs. All together, um, they create a sense of what people live for. So meaning-based needs, those of you who have been sick already know this. Not for everybody, but it's very common for people to start questioning the value of their activities, the meaning of what they've accomplished or not accomplished, what dreams are fulfilled, what are unfulfilled, just this whole kind of internal processing of one's life just seems to naturally start to happen for people. If it's in the context of a terminal illness, we call this life review. But this impulse to reflect on your life seems to be very common for all illness. I had a patient who was um, a choral director before she was ill and ended up with a um, laryngectomy and could no longer sing or um, speak. And this had been her life dream, her life work. And back to that idea of suffering, it was a huge loss for her, as it would be for anybody to lose their voice. But in her case, it was particularly the case. She was a, a trained singer. So one day, her four adult daughters were there and we spontaneously started singing. And because we were singing, a lot of um, staff on the floor came in to listen. And she had a wand, it's a special kind of wand that people have to help with secretions that's kind of long, it looks like a straw. And she, with the tears streaming down her eyes, started leading about 25 people in song. That was a, a meaningful experience for her, where she got to be and express something that had great meaning for her. Another one of these, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but another one of, I think, a meaning-based needs is the need to be of service. So many patients feel that they're on the taking side of things. They feel like they're just, everybody's giving to them, but they are reduced in what they can give back. And I think um, there's really a drive or a need in human beings to be generous. And we see this a lot in our patients. Um, and the young physicians that I train, I, I say to them, when patients are appreciative and thank you, just accept their, the gift of their thank you. Don't push it away. Don't say, I'm just doing my job. No, we're giving people the opportunity to express their appreciations. Very important. In the medical school here, we have a course for the first and second year medical students called Foundations of Patient Care, in which they go around and very fumblingly do initial interviews with patients. And as an FPC leader, it's our job to find patients who are willing to be interviewed by these total beginner doctors in training. And I've always experienced people's willingness to do that. It's often in, um, expressed as, well, that's something I can do to give back. That's something I can do to give. I think that's a, a very sweet and important need that we all need to be aware of in caring for the sick. If religious or spiritual people need the opportunity to express their faith in whatever way that is appropriate for them. Uh, we had an Afghani woman dying in our comfort care suite who was separated. She was young, and she was separated from her family, her parents, who were in a refugee camp in the Middle East. And her father was an imam. 
And we were able to, these are the days before cell phones, like we have now that are very easy, but in those days it involved satellite phones and patching a number of phones together, but we were able to have her father chant the prayer for the dying on speakerphone in our comfort care suite as this patient was dying. So we provided, obviously, a very profound connection and meaning for that family in that situation. Another example of um, religious needs that need to be expressed was a patient who was a shaman and a, a Hmong shaman and he was dying in our ICU. Well, he was going to be extubated and no people knew that he would pass away quickly. And his community needed to participate in a ritual transmission of leadership in his community before he passed away. And this ritual involved a lot of loud gongs <laughs> and about 30 people. And in ICU, that cannot happen. I have to really say UCSF is phenomenal in its support of the expression of religious and spiritual needs of this nature and was able to um, create a situation where this patient, along with three nurses and a respiratory therapist, were moved out of the ICU into our comfort care suite so they could do their ritual. Um, privately and safely and without disturbing anybody else and then taken back to the ICU to be extubated. So these you can see if you do have um, a faith or religious practice in the context of illness or dying it can be extremely healing, nurturing and important to have an opportunity to express that. So those are some meaning uh, needs I'd like to talk a little bit about one more that's on this list known as legacy. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of legacy. It's really about what you wish to bequeath. And we're not talking materially. We're talking of your values, of the things that are important to you, of the heart, the mind, the spirit. So this is Dr. Paul Kalanithi. He is a, uh, was a physician, a neurosurgeon at Stanford, who was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer in his final year of training as a neurosurgeon, and the same year that his daughter was born. And he chose to make his process with um, addressing end of life very public and he wrote several pieces that were published in the New Yorker and uh, I've included an excerpt and the next slide which I will read to you of a letter that he wrote to his infant daughter in which he essentially was bequeathing some value and gift to her and this is what he wrote everyone succumbs to finitude my message is simple. When you come to one of the many moments in life when you must give an account of yourself, provide a ledger of what you have been and done and meant in this world. Do not, I pray, discount that you filled a dying man's days with a sated joy, a joy unknown to me in all of my prior years a joy that does not hunger for more, but rests satisfied in this time, right now, that is an amazing thing. Dr. Kalanithi died in March this year at the age of 37. So Dr. Harvey Chochanoff is a, I don't know what, a psychiatrist maybe in our field who has developed a whole protocol of legacy work uh, that he includes um, a series of questions. I'm not going to um, belabor this list, but it's in the handout if you're interested. And to just point out one or two that I find really meaningful and often use in my interviews with patients. What are your hopes and dreams 
for yourself, for your loved ones. What's most important to you? What are you most proud of? Um, these kinds of questions open up that life review. And sometimes we help people with videos or written documents um, to create legacy documents for their loved ones. So that's the meaning section. And this is the final one is reconciliation needs. This is often uh, people who feel that they've done something that they regret or have shame or self-condemnation about. It can be a history of criminal activity, addiction, betrayal, and whether it's uh, you feel that someone you're, you're kept out of someone else's heart and you wish them to forgive you, or whether you feel you've done something that you need to forgive somebody else or forgive yourself. Um, so this need for forgiveness really comes up strongly in the context of life review, in the context of serious and terminal illness. Need to make amends. So we had a patient who was terminal in our ICU who was choosing more and more um, extreme interventions to be kept alive. And in having a pretty deep heart to heart with her about what she was doing, she basically said that she was hanging on for the hope that her daughter would forgive her. And there had been childhood abuse in the family and the daughter as an adult was no longer speaking to this patient. and. She really deeply wanted that reconciliation. I, I can tell you that it did not happen. Um, sometimes, however, we can help. There are situations where people are seeking reconciliation and we're able to support that need and that experience. Um, we had a forensic patient who was sent to us from a prison to die in the hospital because the prison lacked the necessary medical care that he needed. And because of that, he was able to be with his family in his dying. That would not have happened were he to have died in the prisons. So that was an amazing opportunity for reconciliation just on the level of being together. And a final example is a patient who, again, um, all of these stories are people who have given me permission to share their stories, um, who was given a terminal diagnosis, a prognosis of two months, the same, virtually the same day that she found out that her husband had committed um, a serious crime. And she was beside herself with distress and anger at her husband. And essentially when she heard the palliative care team met her and she kind of zeroed in on me and said, stay, stay in the room, please. And I stayed and she said, please, can you help me? I don't want to die hating my husband. And right now I hate him. So we did the crash forgiveness course. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm very proud of what she accomplished because she actually was able to truly um, release that uh, rage and and heal and heal that relationship before she died. So there's two special cases of, of um, reconciliation needs that I just want to draw attention to. One is called moral injury and the other religious wounding. So moral injury happens a great deal with vets. I think this is an amazing photo. Um, people who have engaged in behaviors that transgress their own moral code. And this happens a great deal for um, soldiers in combat once they're out of the armed services and they're particularly under the duress and strain of a serious or terminal illness. These regrets or guilt or self-recrimination, lack of forgiveness come forward in a very strong way. Again, the work here is for self-forgiveness. And then religious wounding speaks to the underbelly of religious faith, which is there are 
many people who have been harmed and wounded, often in childhood, in religious communities of faith where there's a um, abuse of power or a situation uh, where a person grows up with a fear of uh, eternal damnation, for instance. I've had many patients want to confess their sins. Um, and we certainly, as a clergy person, I'm very open to hearing people's confession. My own theology does not include that kind of a severe judgment. But for many people, they've inherited a religious worldview that can be wounding. And that can be very problematic in the context of serious illness or terminal terminal scenarios. Um, one situation in our own um, setting here was a patient who was a Jehovah's Witness who needed blood products. And some of you may know that that is prohibited in that tradition. And she made the decision to go ahead and receive these blood products, which was fine. But the problem with that um, religious perspective for her was that it's also part of the um, tradition that if a member of the church violates that taboo, then other members of the church are told to shun that, page, that person. And all of her family were members of the church. So every one of her family members had to grapple with not just their loved one making that decision, but their own standing in the church given that situation. So that sounds like extreme, but we do deal with situations like that um, not um, irregularly. So I'm going to move on now to the topic of culture. So all of that was under spirituality. I'm not going to talk too much about culture except to give you some great examples of culture. And just these are some of the areas in which culture has a huge impact on illness, the illness experience, treatment decisions, and particularly end of life scenarios. So I want to start with values because we tend to be a little myopic about values. 60 years ago, in the 1950s and 60s, something in the range of 90% of oncologists did not tell their patients about their prognosis. Here we are now in 2015, and it's exactly reversed. 90% of oncologists do tell patients their prognosis. So this value of patient autonomy and informed decision making and shared decision making has undergone, at least in terms of end of life care, a pretty profound values upheaval in the last 50 years. So we tend in our culture, in Western medical culture, to put high value on autonomy and informed consent. But I think it's important for us to have some cultural humility about this and recognize that not everybody shares those values. And in fact, most cultures of the world do not prioritize those values. So something like communication, whether patients want to be told what's going on, or whether they'd rather you talk to a family member or all the family members should be involved in any decision. No single person makes decisions. These are culturally mediated values that can impact decision making of all kinds in the context of serious and terminal illness. Attitudes toward the medical system altogether. If you are a member of a marginalized, historically targeted group, you might have tremendous distrust of medical culture, med medical processes, being in a hospital at all. Um, whether you utilize advanced care planning is often culturally mediated. Caucasians utilize advanced care planning at a rate of some magnitude greater than any other ethnic group. Um, styles of grieving are culturally determined. 
many t is the time I've gone into a room where all the range from complete silence, stoicism, to wailing, throwing yourself on the floor, and everything in between, often culturally um, expected. So just to have some recognition that this is a huge area of impact and influence on all of our decisions and choices um, related to treatment and end-of-life care as well. So here we come to the most common regrets. This is the last section of the talk about what we can take home from this, ex our, this learning, what we're learning, and what we can hope to learn from people who are seriously ill and dying. So this was a study done by a hospice uh, nurse. And somebody mentioned one of these already. I've talked about, I want to be happier. I thought that was very insightful of you to bring that up. Um, that I would, people expressing both relational needs, I wish I'd spent more time, less time working, more time with friends. Um, I wish I'd had the courage to be more authentically who I am. I think learning from this experience is one of the perspectives of palliative care, that serious and terminal illness is a very rich time in a person's life. And if their symptoms are managed so that they have some bandwidth for contemplating and thinking about some of these things, that um, it allows people to prioritize and, and teach us, those of us who are not yet in this position, what is important. So just to bookend regrets, these are the most common hopes of the dying. Um, and again, we always, everybody hopes not to suffer and that includes most first on the list, the medical management of symptoms. If someone is in excruciating pain or intractable hiccups or nausea, it's pretty hard to think about anything else. Your world kind of narrows down pretty badly in that situation. But if those things are handled, then the kinds of things people hope for, not to die alone, um, not to feel like they're a burden, to be in connection and belonging, um, and to be remembered, to feel like you will be remembered and valued. So you can see how these reflect that typology of spiritual needs that um, I spoke about earlier. So this is a quote from one of palliative care luminaries, Dr. Panelot referred to him last in his talk, Dr. Ira Bayak, who's seen thousands of palliative care patients and who holds this, I think, really ethical uh, mandate of palliative care to recognize the possibilities of serious illness and terminal illness as a, as a developmental stage of life. I think it is realistic to hope for a future in which nobody has to die alone and nobody has to die with his pain untreated. But comfort and companionship are not all there is. I have learned from my patients and their families a surprising truth about dying. This stage of life holds remarkable possibilities. Despite the arduous nature of the experience, when people are relatively comfortable and know that they are not going to be abandoned, they frequently find ways to strengthen bonds with people they love and create profound meaning in the final passage. So sometimes the suffering that we talked about can lead to a, something that I think is incredibly important, which is an enlarged sense of compassion and empathy for others. We, we, we hear this so often from patients who are ill, this just opening of the heart toward the suffering of others, which is a, a definition of compassion. People often gain clarity and are able to share that clarity with others. And we are doing uh, a great service to patients to give, 
give them the opportunity to think about these things and to express these things. Um, there's a lot of uh, research and empiric evidence that providing people an opportunity, as we try to do in palliative care, to manage symptoms well, so that people have this opportunity to reflect on their lives, to think about what's important, to share and communicate with others, and to feel that love and connection, um, and to repair broken bonds, um, allows people to um, find a kind of depth of wisdom and peace that uh, can be deeply meaningful. So this is my last slide. <laughs> People often ask palliative care clinicians how they can do this work. We are indeed exposed to a great deal of loss and suffering and debility and tragedy and dying. But I think I speak for my colleagues across the board when I say that it is also incredibly enriching work. It is a privilege to be part of people's lives at such an intimate and sacred time, and that we're given as much, if not more, than we give. I think part of that wisdom that is a possible um, outcome of facing illness and dying squarely in the ways we're talking about here is perspective. I looked this up. There have been over 100 billion people who have lived and died. None of us gets out alive. And the cause of death is birth. So we, we share this human experience. And I personally find that comforting, that this is part of the blueprint, if you will. It's just as the mystery of birth. None of us have an answer for how that happens. And it's the same at the other end, at the close of life. The mystery of death is a great mystery, but we all share in it. So I'd like to uh, end with an adaptation of a poem by Marge Piercy called Kaddish. And Kaddish is uh, a Jewish prayer that's said um, for the dead. She rewrote it, and I rewrote hers a little bit. We stand in a great web of being, joined together. Let us praise, let us love the life we are lent. Time fl flows through us like water. The past and the dead speak through us, and we breathe out our children's children's blessing. Blessed is the earth from which we grow. Blessed the ones who teach us, Blessed the ones we teach. Blessed this life we are lent. And let us say, Amen. Thank you. <laughs>